In 2024, choose a podcast that allows you to seize the narrative. Whichever path is an interactive horror and dark fantasy anthology where your decisions affect the story. Our tales feature characters finding themselves in the thick of the unknown while tackling issues like class, identity, gender, race, and spirituality. Your part of this is to help our characters make the decisions that either get them through the horror or leave them there. At the end of each episode, listeners are provided with a choice, which they can vote on on our website. At the end of each week, we tally up those choices, and the majority determines which episode we release next, and lets you see the direct outcome of your intervention. Listen, vote, and then sleep with a clear consequence. Choose the path. Season 5 of The Morbid Forest is brought to you by our sponsors, Mortis Maledictum, as well as our faithful travelers. While the show is a labor of love, we really appreciate you taking your time out to support us. Our faithful travelers this season are Pele Freed, Brad Estridge, Randy Lovings, Leah Weber, Ashley Dean, Daniel Parrish, the team at Maltopia, Sarah Zartoloma, and Byron Veerling. Whether you are a regular traveler or a faithful traveler sponsoring the show, we can't express how much we appreciate you guys. From the bottom of our hearts, we love you guys, and this show wouldn't exist without you. And we can't wait to show you what we have in store for you. This podcast contains adult content and themes. For more detailed trigger warnings, please check our show notes. Listener discretion is advised. nice to visit down memory lane with you. Reminds me of the path I chose in coming to this place. <sighs> Speaking of duties. Hello there, traveler and traveler. My, my, my. Seems you have a hitchhiker there. Oh, don't you worry. Ranger Harper is here to help you free yourself of that nasty entanglement. Oh, don't fret. This isn't my first exorcism. In a small conference room sat a group of priests along with a local bishop of the church. Among the priests was Father Craig Murphy. The bishop began speaking about a recently approved case. As the bishop reviewed the case, Father Murphy found himself leaning in, enraptured by the case. This particular report was the possession of a ten-year-old boy whom Murphy knew all too well. The boy was a member of his congregation since he was born, 
and even performed the child's baptism. Thoughts swirled about his lost lamb, but before they became too clouded, the bishop called for his attention. Murphy, the family has specifically asked to perform the exorcism. Although unorthodox, we have decided to grant their request. Murphy nods and thanks the bishop and other priests. Once he reaches the safety of his car, he releases the breath he'd been holding. The father has demons of his own to deal with. However, now was time to battle against the real thing. Murphy put the car in drive, heading through the countryside. Heavy, black, oppressive clouds blanketed the rolling hills around him in darkness. Was this a sign of what was to come? By the time he reached his destination, rain pelted his car. Racing across the large driveway to the loom home, he knocks and the young boy's mother greets him, ushering him in quickly from the downpour. Mrs. Afton wrings her hands over and over as she shows Murphy to their den. Like a hummingbird, she tuts around the room, shakily lighting candles and fluffing pillows in no need of fluffing. Mr. Afton stomps into the room soon after, internal compass guiding him straight to the whiskey cabinet. Whiskey, Father? Murphy looks over at the bottle and finds himself tempted, but the weight of the book in his hands outweighs the vice. The whiskey would only cloud his swirling mind more so than it already was. No, no thank you. The commotion above the father's head has his fingers wrapping around his Bible tighter. <laughs> Laughter bubbles through the ceiling planks like tar. Murphy glances at the couple with fluttering lids. Mr. Afton's hand shook with such force, Murphy was surprised more liquor wasn't pooling on the carpet at his feet. Mrs. Afton, on the other hand, was shaking her glass feverishly at her husband, silently begging for another pour. Tears glitter in her eyes, turning the priest's gaze to the floor. <clears throat> how, how, how did this start? Timothy and his friend were messing around in that damn old graveyard a few weeks ago. Idiots decided it was a good idea to play some sort of game. What, what sort of game? I don't know. Some summoning the spirits game they made up. If I'd have known this would happen, I'd have tanned that boy's hide sooner than I let him go to that graveyard. Murphy nods. While he didn't agree with heavy-handed punishment for children, anything that may have deterred the boys from doing what they did may have been a better option. What about the other boy? Mrs. Afton finally takes a seat in the chair opposite the priest. Her second tumbler of whiskey dangles in her hand. The contents already drained. His mother says he's fine, which, frankly, Father, has us both puzzled. Father Murphy hums, encouraging her to continue. Dark circles mar her elegant face. Tendrils of chestnut and ash frame her face, making her appear much older in the soft light. She's silent for a moment, staring into the candle between them as if it will provide the answers for her. Things begin happening so quietly, just a whisper of odd behavior here and there. Murphy leans in as the woman begins relaying in detail her son's declining state. She describes the boy's mannerism shifting from the kind, sweet-natured soul to a viscous, foul-mouthed heathen. Timothy soon graduated from constant fights with his parents to harming the livestock in their barn. Through racking sobs, Mrs. Afton recounted the mutilated corpses of her hens of the hot poker left in the center of the room for her to find. Mr. Afton had reached his limit at that point, she states. They never put their hands on him before this day. However... Mr. Afton knew the bite of a belt and its ability to correct. The boy only laughed during the ordeal. He laughed and spoke in tongues as his father attempted to instill paternal fear in the child, but it was to no avail. 
At night, Mrs. Afton began reading the Bible at his bedside. Timothy became violent toward her, throwing anything at her he could get his hands on. Father, it has gotten so much worse since then. Sobs rack Mrs. Afton's fragile frame. The boy's father watches on before knocking back another glass of amber courage. Father, I don't wish you to judge us too harshly for our actions, but we had to do what needed to be done. Murphy's head shakes from side to side as he rises. He attempted to drain the pity from his bones before the Afton saw. He couldn't fault the parents for their reactions, but if this case was just a cry for attention and bad parenting, it will be another matter. Gathering his strength, Father Murphy removed his coat, fishing his purple stole from the inner pocket. He took comfort in its familiar weight, kissing its crest before placing the royal item around his neck. Gathering his Bible, he ascends the stairs to Timothy's room. The upstairs is eerily quiet. The void swallowing the atmosphere of the upper level sent a quiver through Murphy's stomach, but he was determined to save the boy. His feet carried him to the boy's door, a faint green glow emanating from the crack between the door and the hardwood floor. A shaky hand reaches for the doorknob, the knob searing his flesh as his hand enclosed around the freezing metal. Not waiting a moment longer, lest he loses his nerve, Father Murphy allows the door to swing wide and beholds the sight within. Timothy lay in his bed, hands tied to the bedposts. The boy's stench threatens to knock the father into the wall behind him. His clothes are covered in a thin layer of grim, the smell of human defecation swimming in the room. As the father steps in, he eyes the dampened pallet of the boy's face. Pumps and opened sores riddle his once youthful face, a face Father Murphy blessed every Sunday since the boy was born. The boy's breathing picks up speed once the father is fully in the room. The door cracks shut behind the priest, sealing him and his ward inside. Like an animatronic doll needing service, the boy's head slowly rotates in the father's direction. Timothy's eyes are white, the pupil gone. A smile fissures across his face as he takes in his holy guest. For the first time in his life, Murphy is terrified. He wasn't supposed to be. His faith was meant to ground him, make him stronger in the face of evil. However, today was different. Today he gazed upon true evil. Murphy lay his briefcase down on top of the dresser and began pulling vials of holy water from it. He would persevere for the sake of the boy's soul. With quick flicks, Father Murphy cast vial after vial of holy water onto the boy. His skin sizzles, sending Timothy into a fit of screams. Smoke plumes above the bed, forming an angry cloud. Every droplet of blessed water increases the measure of screams, hiking the priest's shoulder up. Guilt breaks within him for harming the boy. Murphy pushes on his hands trembling as he pulls his Bible from his pocket to begin the exorcism. And with the Father and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Murphy ignores him reciting the first line, but the demon is undeterred. Tell me, priest, what does it feel like to be 
trapped in your own personal hell. Murphy refuses to take his eyes off of the Bible. One hand jets out in the direction of the infestation, his voice nearly catching in his throat. The power of Christ compels you! The power of Christ compels you! Holy water peppers the demon. However, it only causes him to laugh more. Father Murphy pours the words in front of him into the room. Yet they do little but turn the boy into a rag doll for the demon to play with. Timothy's body bows from the bed, vertebrae cracking as he contorts. Father Murphy rushes from the room and into the bathroom. Vomit sprays from his mouth moments before he makes it to the sink. When the father is finished, he straightens, splashing cold water on his face. After drying his face off, the priest glimpses of his reflection in the mirror. He hasn't looked at himself in days. For a moment, he thought he saw a flash of darkness behind his hazel eyes. He looks away before he thinks to examine it closer. I'm not evil. I'm not evil. I am not evil. Father Murphy turns the light off, exiting the bathroom. For the next three hours, he works on freeing the boy from his suffering. He reads from the scripture, he douses Timothy in holy water until the young boy's flesh boils and bubbles. The father hounds the entity to expel from the boy, to give up its hellish name and allow the father to give the family peace. The demon will have none of it. Anger at his lack of success cripples the priest, but it tries to push it down. Behold the cross of the Lord. Flee bands of enemies. The lion of the tribe Judah. The offspring of David hath conquered. Conquered! <laughs> I have conquered and Leave this boy! We command you! The demon suddenly stops, perking up. Pearl lesson eyes roll forward, assessing the father. His palms itch as the demon within the boy takes him in. The demon squints, as if finally seeing the man for the first time. His mouth begins to part, a question glazing his demonic features, but the words are snuffed out. Mrs. Afton bangs into the room. The mother sways on her feet, clearly drunk. Her face is a flame of emotion. Snot dribbles from her nose in long, sticky trails. Father, please. Is that not enough for one night? How much more can he take? Until the deed is done. He is one of my own. I refuse to leave him in this state. However... For your sake, I will stop. I... I need a moment to collect myself. This... This has proven more taxing than I anticipated. Your family is my flock, and, and I cannot leave a member up to flounder. Please, go back downstairs. It will be over soon. A sensation fluttered in the priest's stomach. At his words, but he washes it away. The woman nods allowing Father Murphy to take her elbow and guide her from the room. Once she has ambled down the steps, Murphy shuts himself inside the bathroom once more. His old knobby hands wrap around the basin of the sink, stealing himself for this next part. From his pocket, he draws a thin leather billfold. He is not practiced in this new method. However, he will not fail his charge. Slowly, he lays the billfold on the counter, opening it. He takes in the small vial, syringe, and thin elastic strap. His gaze rises to the mirror, ready to take in his reflection. I am not evil. Stygian tendrils web through his hazel irises, threatening to consume them. A rumbling voice rattles the base of his skull but he slaps his hand over the holy vial, silencing it. I am not evil. I am the right hand of God. 
Father Murphy draws the holy saline into the needle, then wraps his arm with the tourniquet. His cephalic vein throbs to the surface. A scream ruptures his mind, but the holy man holds fast. You will help me exercise that boy. If it is the last thing I do, you will tell me the name of the demon within the child, and you will bow to my will. A new dawn was emerging, and so were the methods of the church. For one to banish evil, it first must understand it. One must walk alongside its enemies to grasp the depths of their depravity. The old methods were gone, and a new age of priests created. Over the years, the church collected each demon banished, hoarding them away for a time such as now. They understood how to bind them to a soul, and to protect that soul once the ritual was complete. Evil did not yet know what lurked in the darkness, waiting to exile it back to his fiery lair. The demon placed inside Father Murphy thrashed against his invisible chains, but it did little use. Taking a deep breath, the priest plunged the holy solution into his veins. A scream of agony quakes through him, but he does not release it. Father Murphy doubles over, panting. Slowly, he raises his face to the mirror, the darkness looking back. There is silent obedience in the depths. If the demon refuses to cooperate, well, there was more solution to subdue it. Now, let us begin. This has been a Morbid Forest production, and on this episode you've heard The First Exorcism, written by Sean Moreau and Destiny Pfeiffer, with narration by Jessica Hart as your narrator, Father Murphy as Sean Moreau, The Bishop as Ron Hyatt, Mr. Afton by Matthew Trevino, Mrs. Afton by Glinda Villamar, and The Demon as Naomi Richards. Story editing and audio production by Naomi Richards. Our theme music this season is The Shadows by Nandi Bushill. Music and sound effects provided by Epidemic Sound. And don't forget to check out Whichever Path Podcast. Whichever Path is an interactive horror and dark fantasy anthology where your decision affects the story. At the end of each episode, listeners are provided with a choice which they can vote on on their website. At the end of the week, they tally up the choices and the majority choice determines which episode they release next and lets you see the direct outcome of your intervention. Whichever Path Podcast is available on all podcast platforms. We're back. (laughs) We are so excited to be back for another season of The Morbid Forest. We have quite the story list planned for you guys this season and a few twists and fun things along the way so we hope that you are ready for it travelers follow us on x or for those of us that still call it twitter instagram threads and discord to stay up to date on all the happenings within the forest interested in more morsels of the forest then join our patreon As a faithful traveler, you'll receive exclusive access to early episode releases, bonus content, and deals on merch for only $3 a month. That's patreon.com slash themorbidforest. And with that, we'll see you next time, travelers, on The Morbid Forest.